Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over the UFC card for this Saturday from Las Vegas. Um, we're going to be analyzing from a DFS perspective and uh, looking to repeat the successes of last week, where uh, several people did really well, including uh, yours truly, uh, ended up winning the big GPP on DraftKings, split it with just a couple of people for 43000 just essentially just doing exactly what uh, I talked about doing when we did this uh, this video last week. Now, again, that's something that should not be repeated every week. But again, this is what makes this endeavor fun is, is to continue to refine your process. And um, that's what these videos are designed to do. Yes, we're going to go over the plays and things like that. But hopefully you guys learn how to make your own plays and how to analyze things on your own if you know something happens to me and I don't do these videos anymore to be all morbid or anything like that but that's the idea the idea is is to teach you guys how to analyze in the same way that i am um because i think we have a good process of how to analyze lineups okay so one thing that is different about this card as opposed to uh from last card is that there are less fights for one so there are 11 fights as opposed to 12 last week. the second thing the real important thing that's different is the status of the favorites um, last week, as you might recall, we had very little interest from a DFS perspective in anybody over 9K. Um, specifically, the main event uh, favorite, uh, Israel Adesanya, we had almost zero of him. But there were others uh, that were like 9,500 that we had no interest in, very little interest in, in Hawksbrush, very little interest in Tapa, very little interest in, in a lot of guys over 9K. And what we really had to do last week was, was hone in on the big, juicy underdogs that we liked. And those, as you might recall, were Miranda, Chepi Mariscal, uh, Austin Lane, and a fourth one, which I forget because he lost. Um, nonetheless, uh, we, we got two of those underdogs in, and we thought that those would provide a lot of upside, and they did. Uh, so Mariscal and um, Miran Miranda just basically set the pivots on the entire lineup construction. That plus the first fight of the night, which we liked, and we ended up just getting you know, some good results elsewhere. This week, it's different. This week, we really need to prioritize some of these 9K and up fighters because, as you'll see, there's just an incredible ceiling this week for those for those uh, fighters. In addition, the other thing that's different about this this week is is the main event. You know, as I mentioned last week, we essentially faded the whole main event. We did play some Strickland, and the irony was that. The reason we played Strickland was because we figured that if he won, you know, even though he only had a 20% winning chance, he would probably be in the optimal. And it turns out he won and he wasn't in the optimal anyway, you know, so that was interesting. But this week, uh, the main event is, is you know, probably more mathematically playable. Now, does that mean you have to play it? No, because of ownership concerns. But the point is, is that it's a very different type of slate and all the slates are different. Um but this one is significantly different from last week. So let's let's get after it. Let's just go from the bottom up this time and see what we have. So right off the bat, you have a $9,500 fighter, Jake Knutson, um, Josephine Knutson, low-level women's fight against uh, Matt Marnik Mann. And again, for a $9,500 fighter, you're going to need for her to have an inside-the-distance line of, I mean, at least minus 150. I guess, and, and hopefully some round one upside where her chances of finishing the first round is at least plus 200. Um, and it would be nice if she had a lot of takedown upside as well. So at 9,500 is a very, very tough price tag to justify. So let's see what she has here. Um, yeah, she has big win odds, but we don't really care too much about that. Her odds of finishing inside the distance is is not even favored i mean she's like plus 160 or so when you um when you factor in vig or something like that um so it's an atrocious play you know not to mention she doesn't really have a lot of takedown upside you don't even have to look at round one i mean round one Knutson is plus 450 so so she is an extremely poor play now does that mean you can't play her in 150 because, as I mentioned, there's going to be a lot of really strong favorites that everybody's going to play. And I imagine that Knudsen is going to be, you know, 10% owned at most, uh, given how good these other favorites are. 
um, is that leverage that you're going to get enough to overcome a really, really poor inside the distance line. My inclination is it is not. Um, I'll probably get a little bit of her, probably with the field, maybe 10% just in case. But uh, there, it's going to take like a lot of lineups for me to get to her. Um, and Marnique Mann, so the problem with her is unfortunately um, she just doesn't win often enough. I mean, she, she's going to win this fight, what, 15% of the time? And the question is, is if she wins even, is, 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 it, is it even going to be optimal? Um, maybe, but not, but not all the time. You know, if she gets like a couple of takedowns and somehow gets a good decision in her favor, I don't know, maybe she gets 75 or 80, which is okay. But it really is not 100% guaranteed that she makes optimal. And when you're only 15% to win, it's very, very tough to play. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say about playing Marty Mann is that Josephine Knutson is not going to be very highly owned. So you don't get that leverage opportunity to play Mar Marty Mann either. Um, the only justification for playing her would be if you are just really just overloading on those big uh, favorites, just to make sure you get all the combination of the underdogs in case the quote unquote good looking underdog just didn't get there. Um it's also possible that she gets a couple of takedowns and scores like 40 in a loss. So those are okay reasons to play her maybe in 150, but neither of these fighters are going to be anything remotely a priority. Um, priority, I mean, uh, not even maybe the top 30 or 40 lineups. Charlie Campbell versus Alex Reyes. So here's the first of the just extremely strong favorites here. You have Charlie Campbell, whose price is, it's less than Newton for a, you know, for, for comparison. So at 9,300, you need to have an inside the distance line of about, you know, minus 110, you know, minus 110 plus some grappling upside maybe, or maybe minus 130 in the absence of grappling upside. Um, and when you look at him, I mean, this is an incredible inside the distance prop here. You have uh, Campbell inside the distance is minus like 250. I mean, that's just insane. Um, not to mention... Campbell in round one is minus 120. Not to mention that he could also maybe get some takedowns. I mean, this is just a just an elite, elite play. Um, and I imagine will be one of the two or three highest owned fighters on the slate. I'll get to the other two later. But it's just kind of hard to deny these metrics. Um, one thing you always want to do when you find a play which is just amazing is see if the other side is okay. Because that's kind of like my, 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 uh, everybody's got their own themes. And that's one thing I always think about in MMA. The best plays really in GP please, GPPs are when you have one fighter who is an incredibly credible play and the other fighter is okay. The fighter who is okay is an incredible play because everybody's going to see what I see about the one fighter being an amazing play, pile ownership on that player on that fighter. And if, as long as the other fighter is just kind of in an okay spot, it makes it extremely strong. So we do always have to take a look at Alex Reyes here. Um, the, the tough part about it is that number one, he just doesn't win too often. You know, he's plus three fifty, So honestly, he's going to win about 20% of the time. Although, I mean, you look at his, his inside the distance line is probably going to really poor. Also, it's like plus like one, plus like a thousand, you know, so the only thing I would say is if somehow, some way, Alex Reyes wins the 20% of the time, he's, again, going to get leverage, at least, against Campbell, okay? Um, so, again, same type of thing. I don't think Alex Reyes is a good pivot. I don't think he's good leverage necessarily. But in 150, because of how high on Campbell is going to be, I would sprinkle, uh, you know, 10% of him just in case. Um, all right, so uh, Campbell, again, first of our really strong priority plays. Tracy Cortez versus Jasmine Ju Joseph Vicious. So this is this is a really tough one, you know, because these mid-range fights, uh, when, when you get involved in these mid-range fights, you com obviously you commit, but you sort of commit mathematically to a certain type of construction, okay? Um, and if you fade those fights, then you commit to a different type of construction. When you fade those fights, you get the, the big high price guys and the low price guys. That's just the way it is. Um, and 
if you don't like the high price guys and the low price guys, then you could you know, then playing these mid range fights are, are pretty important. But if you like the high price guys and the low price guys, then these mid range fights can be kind of sucker plays sometimes. And I tell you that this fight kind of feels like something I want to avoid. I mean, there's another one we get to a, a little later. So first, let's look at the at the odds. I mean, it's a pick 'em fight, basically. Cortez a slight favorite. And then you have her being a slight favorite on the on the DraftKings slate, so it's the same thing. With respect to the inside the distance line, I mean, we don't ask for much. I mean, at, at, at Pickham, maybe like plus 250 inside the distance. But this fight, like, it's like both of them like plus 900, you know. And the reason for that is because they're both kind of wrestlers. They're both wrestlers. And these fights, when you have wrestlers versus wrestlers, they just usually result in stalemates. I mean, they, you don't get the big upside from one of the fighters that leads to those 95 point decisions, which is what you're going to need. Um, I mean, you're going to need 95 points for an 8K fighter um, or 100, really. And unless you're going to get a finish, which you're not getting here, you're going to need a real dominant performance from the wrestling. And when you have two very, very accomplished wrestlers, that usually doesn't happen because just because a wrestler is usually good defending takedowns. Also, now there are some exceptions. Um, there are some fighters who are just really good offensively that are poor when they're trying to defend. But for the majority, I mean, this is the, these fights usually tend to, to stalemate out. Um, we use a couple couple of weeks ago. You had Aaron Blanchfield against uh, Talia Santos, and it was very very similar situation. You know, two very accomplished grapplers. And they both exhibited good offense and good defense, and and the fight busted from a DFS perspective. So I, I'm that's the way I'm approaching this fight as well. Uh, I, I'm probably just going to fade this one. Um, now again, in 150, you can play it, you know, whatever. But in, in as priority plays, I think that these are the fights on a card like this that you probably can avoid because again, we're trying to get to the top guys. We don't want to play these mid range builds here, and and when those mid range builds are really not don't really have great plays. Uh, I think that this fight's probably a pass. Okay, Edgar Shires versus Daniel De Silva, uh, minus 200 plus 180. So I'm expecting like 9K, 7,200, something like that. And I actually have Shires, who's 8,700. And that's a little bit of line value, honestly, at Shires. I mean, well, that's not necessarily true because some of these 9K fighters we see to this week are like minus 500. So as opposed to your usual, like minus 250, minus 300. So it's not that much line value. But the real key to this fight is the incredible inside the distance lines and the incredible met uh, metrics we have. So at these prices, Chirez at 8,700 needs to have an inside the distance prop of about, I don't know, plus 140, maybe plus 130 to be viable, maybe plus 120 if you want to get greedy. And at 7,500, De Silva needs to have an inside the distance prop of about, I don't know, plus 300, maybe a little bit less. And when you look at the inside the distance line here, you have Chirez who, Chirez inside the distance, like minus 170 or minus 150. I mean, that's just an insane opportunity here. Um, and the reason for that is because De Silva just really just brings the heat and brings the, uh, and brings the upside for both fighters and brings the pace. Um, he very rarely makes it out of the first round. And when he does, he doesn't usually make it out of the second round. And you look at his inside the distance line, and it's it's pretty strong, you know. When when you when you you're dealing with Vig, it's probably like plus two seventy or something. So both sides of these this fight are extremely uh, extremely strong, and this is one fight that you really want to target here, and you definitely want to target both sides. Um, so either Chirez or we can put Silva. It doesn't really matter. You're probably going to play both sides of this fight. Roman Kapila versus Josh Fremd. All right. So Kapilov at 9,100, he is going to need about an inside the distance line of about minus 110. And grappling upside would be great, but he doesn't have any. And what would also be nice is if he had a round one upside of maybe plus 200 again. Um, and for Josh Fremd, his inside the distance line needs to not be much, maybe like plus 350 or have a lot of takedown upside. We're going to get to that in a second. Let's just first take a look at Kopulov's inside the distance line. Kopulov inside the distance is pretty strong, you know, minus 125 uh, with Vig, maybe minus 115 or something like that. So it's, it's he's a, he is a good play. 
the the thing about him though is when you get further down into the metrics his round one prop is not great i mean it's plus 240 um and when you count to vegas like plus 270 and the thing is that copula being a pure striker he does not get anything other than the the you know the the, uh, the win bonuses in other words the ko bonuses he doesn't get the, 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 those takedowns and the control time to pile on points. He might get some knockdown equity, but aside from that, I mean, these strikers only when they need to, I mean, they really need to win in the first round to justify their price tags are very, very difficult. He's just barely on the outside looking in as being a great play just because this round one prop is not terrific. Um, the other side of this, you have friends. And Fremd, his inside the distance line is pretty much non-existent here, I think. Fremd inside the distance is, uh, what is he? It's like plus 550, which is terrible. The question is, question is, is does he have enough wrestling upside? Okay. Um, it really depends on who you ask. I mean, I, I've, I've done analysis on myself. I've looked at other fighter. I've looked at other content. And I will say this. That if Fremd is going to win, I mean, he's probably going to be some combination of clinch work and, and, and takedowns. There's very few variations where he wins, just keeping it on the feet. So we're, we're then back at what his just win odds are. So his win odds are only, he's only going to win the fight, you know, what's this? He's plus 300 or so. So I don't know, 25% of the time. And of those times, how often is he optimal? I guess it's okay. You know what I mean? Because he's not gonna he's not gonna finish him too often. And then also, I mean, he's got to get he's got to get multiple takedowns really because the the judges have been favoring the strikers, and for him to actually get a decision, I think you're gonna need more than one takedown. You're probably gonna need more than two. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that. It's probably a good play, DFS, right? Because I mean, he's probably not going to win, but in those 25% that he wins, I mean, we're talking about probably four takedowns are going to be needed. And if that's the case, I mean, he could really get 100. You know, is he going to? No, probably 75% of the time he doesn't, maybe more. But of those times he wins, I think he's legit. So I I'm going to include him in, in, my, in my underdog pool. Um, it's not going to be, I don't think it's going to be top 20% or top, you know, top 20 lineups, but maybe, I don't know. I, I, I might, I might talk myself into him. And with respect to Kopilov, he's just a little bit worse than he's a lot worse of a play than Campbell. We're going to get to others in a minute. Well, he's certainly probably a better play than Knudsen. Um, I don't even think he's a better play than Chires though, for example, you know, so Chires, his inside his inside is much, much better. And he has some first round upside as well. So, I think that I'm going to be under the field on uh, Kopilov, which means, again, that Fram doesn't really have that same leverage. But even still, I think Fram is, is viable. So I think that I'll be a little bit under on Kopilov, a little bit over on Fram. Sorry if that's hedging a little bit too much here, but that's just kind of the way I feel about this fight. I might talk myself into Fram a little bit more as we get later on. Um, but... Uh, because again, I, don't, I just don't see how he wins other than getting four or five takedowns. And if that's the case, then the twenty-five percent of the time that he does win, we're, um, you know, you're sitting, you're sitting pretty. All right, uh, moving on, we have Lupe Godinez versus Elise Reed. Um, just I try not to watch content on this fight. Whenever Lupe Godinez fights, you, see, you just see the same thing. Everybody is just coming in saying. Well, all she has to do is wrestle. Why doesn't she wrestle? She should just wrestle, wrestle, get her 10 takedowns and win and this. And, 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 and it's just, it's, it's exhausting. It's exhausting listening to it. I mean, if you want to know the truth, um, you know, uh, they said that the last fight. Okay. Last fight, they all just, just, if, if she doesn't go take Ducati down, she's not going to look like a big favorite, but she's an idiot. She should go for the wrestling, but she's not going to, you know what she did? She had one takedown, and then she completely dominated on the feet, okay? And, and the fact is, is that even though you might, as a better, want her to take the 
other fighter down just because you know four or five fights ago or earlier in her career she was a a you know she went to wrestling more often she's been obviously working on her striking for a reason maybe she wants to 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 morph into that type of fighter so you're just not allowed to complain if you if you play her and she doesn't take people down you know she listen the fact is she she lost the fight to Angela Hill but everything else you have one two three four you know what I mean and she lost that one fight it's Carolina but she has wins it's not like she's losing with her with her with her with her approach so I don't know Nonetheless, uh, we'll, let's first take a look at the numbers, then we'll talk about something else about this fight. Um, at 9,400, she's going to need an inside the distance prop of at least minus 110, maybe more. Uh, in addition to that, she's going to probably want some grappling upside. We're going to get back to that in a second. Let's look at her inside the distance line here. Cadenas. Uh, Cadenas inside the distance is actually, it's like plus 160. I thought it was going to be a little worse than that. So, if you listen, if you told me that she was going to be going for takedowns nonstop, I would say she's right up there with some of these others. But you just don't know what she's going to do, you know. And, and, and that's not her only—it's not her only path to victory. Contrary to what people are saying, it might not even be her easiest path to victory. You know what I mean? Um, we think it is, but it might not necessarily be the case. So she's got to—you know—for for, for her to be a good play. She's got to, A, you know, decide that that's the way she wants to go. What's the chance that that happened? And in addition to that, have it be successful. And remember, it's not even successful 100% of the time just because she, just because we think that if she wrestles, she wins 1,000% of the time, doesn't necessarily make it so, you know? So she's got to, number one, do, do the game plan you want. And number two, you'd be right about that game plan working. So... In and of itself, Godinez is just not a good play, right? However, uh, as a GPP play, it is hard to deny the possibility that she could get 125 points, okay? Like, again, in those variations where she, one, goes for the wrestling approach, and two, it works, it is hard to deny the 125, 130-point upside, okay? Um so in GPPs, she's going to be a probably a pretty big part of what I do um, because she's she's honestly she's going to be much lower owned than Campbell. She's going to be much lower owned than other fighters we'll talk about. Um, one in particular, so it's possible she's not very popular. And listen, you know what you're getting into with her. She could get a very nice, easy 90, 85 point win. And you'll be mad that you played her 9,400. But I think that the times that she smashes and scores 130, I think it makes up for it. So I think in GPPs, I'm going to put her in as a pretty decent part of what I'm doing. Uh, Elise Reed, uh, you know, she doesn't win often enough and she doesn't have a strong inside the distance prop. We'll just confirm that. Elise Reed inside the distance is like plus, what is this? Plus uh, 600 or something like that. Is that what it is? Not even like plus. It's not even a number, like plus a thousand, something like that. Um, and the fact that Godinez is not going to be very popular, I imagine, makes at least we not much of a leverage play either. So uh Gadinia is definitely a GPP play. Uh not a priority as far as like 20 match or three match or whatever, but certainly a, a GPP play with a lot of ups. All right, Fernando Padilla versus Kyle Nelson. You have uh Padilla is a minus 250, Nelson plus 196. So I imagine. Padilla is going to be about 9K on this card. Only 8,900. Once again, very similar to, to Chires, I guess. Let's, let's, compare, let's compare those for a second. So you have Padilla is minus 241. Chires is minus, it's the same price uh, money line, but, but Padilla is a little bit more expensive um, uh, here. Let's take a look at the inside the distance line. At 8,900, you want to have, you know, inside the distance line, so if it's minus 110, that's great. Let's just even say it at plus, plus 100. Uh, or, you know, some, some takedown upside. Let's take a look at him. Padilla is inside the distance, minus 110. I mean, pretty reasonable. You know, it's right where you need to be. Um, it'd be nice if he had a first-round prop, which was good. I doubt we're going to see get, get that, though. 
I don't know, Padilla around one plus 240. I mean, it's the same as, as let's, let's look at Knudsen, for example. Knudsen first round was, what was she first round? Like plus 450. Oh, Kapilov. So Kapilov, for example, him round one was plus 240. It's the same. So you're getting a good big discount, even in the round one prop. Um, by playing Padilla. So Padilla is a very, very strong player. Um, the other thing about him is I just think that he's going to get lost a little bit as far as ownership goes in the constructions. Um, I'm going to show you what constructions are going to look like unless people are sharp and, and get themselves off of them. But the Padilla play is going to get lost, I think, in the, in the constructions. I'll give you an example. Actually, let's go through all the fights first. Let's look at Nelson. Nelson, at his price, needs to have an inside the distance line of about plus 340, maybe something like that. Maybe plus, plus 300 would, he, would be nice. Nelson, inside the distance, is plus 350. It's on the border, you know. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of volume, so there's not that. Doesn't really have that much takedown upside, I suppose. I don't know. I consider him... I mean, he's all right. I mean, he's on par with Fremd, I guess, in GPPs. Um, and, well, we're, we're talking about GPPs all the time. When I mean GPPs, I mean like the lottery. So, uh, yeah, I'll sprinkle some Nelson in here. I, again, you don't get a lot of leverage. I don't think Padilla is going to be particularly high owned. Um, so who do I like more between Nelson and, and Fremd? I think, I think I like them similar, actually. I like Padilla more than Kapilov, and I think I like Nelson and Fremd the same. All right, moving on, we have Daniel Zellhuber versus Christian Yagos. You have Daniel Zellhuber is a minus 260. Um, Yagos plus one, you know, 200 or so. So, again, we're expecting to see about, you know, 9K, something like that. And a uh, pretty reasonable price on Zellhuber as far as the money line goes, 8,800. Um, all right. So, again, inside the distance for a Jell Zellhuber, you're going to need inside the distance line. I mean, given what we've been talking about already, I almost want to demand, like, Minus 110, but uh, let's let's give him plus 110. As long as he's plus 110 or with takedown upside, I think he's good. But in the ad, he doesn't really have the takedown upside. So we're just looking for an inside the distance line about plus 110. And when you look at this actual inside the distance line, it's extremely poor. You have Zell Huber inside the distance is like plus 150. Um, so... Okay, maybe I undersold this. Maybe it's not extremely poor, but it's certainly on the poor side. Okay. Um, on the other hand, you have Quistus Yagos. His inside the distance line is like plus 350. Um, at his price, it's somewhat reasonable. And in addition to that, he's got takedown upside. So I think Yagos, I mean, I thought I, I thought this was going to be the case real early in the week. And... Um, I think it kind of holds. I think Yagos is a very, very strong underdog. Given the fact that he both he has that, you know, a decent inside the distance line um, and that takedown upside, I think he's along so far with uh so far along with uh Lacerda. I think these are so far the two best, the two best underdogs uh, if I had to pick them. Um uh, the one thing I would say about Zell Huber is if Yagos turns out to be really popular because of all the things I just said, um, Zell Huber's kind of a lack of an inside the distance line might, might, uh, I don't know, might make him an okay pivot. Problem is he just has nothing in the first rounds and his real as win condition is if, if, if anything, kind of a late finish. And it would probably be striking. So I don't know. I, I think I'm gonna get off be off of him, but but Yagos is an extremely strong underdog as far as I'm concerned. Uh, in DFS. All right, so now we get to the other just insane favorite here. So you have Raul Rosas at 9,600. And normally 9,600 you kind of shy away from. But when you look at the metrics here, it's just kind of ridiculous. Like, like let's for, forget about the win odds for a second, which is already obscene, you know, minus eight hundred. We don't care about his win odds. You know what I mean? When we're taught, trying to find a $9,500 fighter, honestly, we, we're presuming he wins already. What we're, we're going to need is, is, is at least minus 150, I guess, inside the distance. 
And it would be a nice thing if he had takedown upside also. And it would also be nice if he had first round upside. And this dude's got the entire kitchen sink here. I mean, like, first of all, you look at the inside the distance line. First of all, look at this. Rojas inside the distance, like minus 400. I mean, for real? But not only that, you look at him in the first round, it's like minus 180. Not to mention the fact that he is, I mean, he's, he rates to get at least one takedown. I mean, look at it. Rosas Jr., first of all, by submission, is like minus 200. I'll bet you even round one by submission is probably pickup. Let's see. Now check this out. Round one specifically by submission is like pickup. You know what I mean? So, so, so he's almost, he's a big favorite to knock the guy out. I mean, to, to finish the guy. He's a big favorite to put him out in the first round. And he's probably going to do it with takedown. So this is this is like 125 points just kind of waiting to happen. Can it bust? Sure. But but the metrics are just way too strong to ignore here. So between him and Campbell, I mean, you don't want these guys to win in the way that they rate to win without you having it. It becomes very difficult to make up for those points. Okay. So that's why I – I consider Campbell and Rosas two extremely strong plays. Um, I would even consider them. Are they stronger than me than, than Chires? Uh, maybe because Chires doesn't rate to finish in the first round. Um, these guys do. Um, so I, I would recommend trying to trying to get to these guys if at all possible. Now they're going to be they're going to be be popular. So you have to do other other crazy stuff to make your lineups work. But as far as as far as plays go, I mean these guys are awesome. All right, so now we have a uh, co-main event. Uh, oh, well, hold on. What about Terrence Mitchell? Um, okay, first of all, he just doesn't win often. That's 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 the problem. Because he has everything else you want. He has an amazing amount of leverage because everybody's going to play Rosas, I imagine. Um, and I guess when he wins, let's see. Well, actually, look, Mitchell inside the distance is plus seven. All right, let's talk about this. So that means that 15% of the time, he wins inside the distance. You know what? You have to do it. And think about the math here. 15% of the time, he wins inside the distance. How is he not optimal in those cases? You know what I mean? The fight's going to be wild. He's going to win inside the distance. We're already presuming that. So if he scores 90 points plus 100, considering that that Rosas is going to be just, I, I imagine, alongside with Campbell and maybe the main event, the two high, the, one of the highest owned fighters on the slate. I mean, it's gross, but you have to do it, right? So terrible play of the week is going to be Terrence Mitchell, but obviously Rosas is obviously a big priority. But you have, to, I really think you have to play Mitchell in this spot in GPPs. Uh, in the in the lot, Kevin Holland versus Jack Della Maddalena. Um, really good fight. Uh, the line is Della uh, Jack Della is minus one fifty or so. So expect to see about eighty four hundred as far as price, and it's about right eighty three hundred seventy nine hundred. And it's one of these mid range fights that I've been talking about. Similar, well, it's different, but it's let's talk about it the same way we talked about. Uh, Jazz the Vicious versus Cortez. Um, it rates to be probably a striking fight without that many takedowns. So when you have that, you're really relying on either volume or an inside the distance prop that's worth playing. So we're talking about with these prices, you need for Magdalena probably plus 200 at, the, at worst inside the distance. And Holland maybe plus 250. Let's take a look and see what these are. Holland inside the distance is only plus 300. All right, Matt. All right, Jack Mandela Madalena, that's actually not bad. The plus 170. All right, I'm, I'm down. Um, an interesting question, though, is does Holland's takedown upside make up for his lack of an inside the distance prop? Okay, maybe. So, all right. So, so we're going to say that Jack Della Madalena is, is a good play, not a priority play, but a good play. And the reason why it's not a priority play is, again, I just don't think that's the construction that you want. I think you want to get up to those big 
big price guys. And when you play the 8200s or 8300s instead of say the 78s, um, I think you're I think you're 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 asking for trouble. But uh, I will definitely play him. Uh, he'll be in the lottery uh, builds, maybe as much as with the field. I guess Holland is going to be a, I'll be a little bit underwhelmed. So now we get to the main event. We have uh, Grasso versus Shevchenko, and this is going to be extremely high owned uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, it's a five round fight, and Alexa Grasso is a, is a short priced underdog who uh, you know just came. Through, I'm saying the same thing twice, but she she just beat Val Valentina before. It's probably going to be a very competitive fight, and that's why again the prices are what they are. And when you get a a, a a uh, very small underdog in a five round fight like this, uh, she's going to project pretty well um, on, on a median basis. So she's going to be pretty popular. On the other hand, you have Valentina Shevchenko, who um, she's about minus 180, minus 170 or so. So we want her. So her price is probably going to be about 85, 8600, which it is. But the, 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 the big difference here is that Shevchenko, um, at least what it's been argued, is that she has quite a few takedowns in her win condition. And when you just look at her game log, it doesn't, you know, doesn't take a lot of looking to see, you know, um, in addition to that, in her last fight against Rasso, that was where she was garnering the majority of her success was in the takedown. So um, if in fact she goes for these takedowns, let's talk about this, like the repeat, the, 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 the Godinez fight, right? If in fact she does opt for the wrestling, and if in fact it works, so her score, I mean, honestly, it could be 150. Okay. Um, it really, she really could score 150. Uh, will she? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you, I've seen the case is made for that Grasso's grappling's improved and, you know, Shevchenko isn't really going to commit to that and she's not going to dominate her in that way. I'm not saying that she's necessarily going to, but. Problem is, is that I say the problem because she's going to be just really popular. Is that because of the, the the presence of a one fifty in her range of outcomes, it's just hard to fade her. You know what I mean? Like you're just going to have to at least get with the I think at least get with the field on her, just because you can do everything right, and then if she can put that one fifty up, and it's it, 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 forget even one fifty. I mean, this, her last fight, she was winning, and she had another round to work with as far as garnering points and she still got 80 in a loss. So if she didn't get her back taken and continue to win that fight, I mean, she would have had 120 minimum. So her scoring is just way too high to ignore, which is a little annoying. Uh, if I had to fade one part of this, I guess it would be the Grosso side because similarly to, uh, you know, to Strickland, there are variations where she wins uh, Grasso and doesn't make the optimal, um, just like Strickland's were last week. Um, but I, 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 I think Shevchenko. I mean, her. I think her ranges of outcomes in her victories are like from a hundred to one hundred and fifty. You know, and that's just kind of a, it's kind of a difficult thing to fade. Okay? So, um, I mentioned that I would talk about the, uh, the way lineups are going to end up looking. Okay. So what people are going to be doing is they're going to pit, play Grasso over here. They're going to play these two. And then they're almost, I, I imagine that one of these two, these two guys between uh, Chires, well, Lacerda and Yagos, I, I imagine. Are going to be. Well, let's let's not let's not do it that way. Or I think people are going to play this this. Um, uh, I want I want to show you a particular build, which I'm not going to do this. But. So if you play like this, right, and you don't take, let's leave this one blank. Let's say you don't take any shots at like big underdogs, and you play this even fight, this Holland fight. You play Jazz Davicius, you play Grasso. These are a very conservative type approach, right? Um, you know, and then you can shuffle in, you know, Lacerda, Yagos, and something like that, even from these types of builds, I think are going to be extremely popular. Okay. And what's going to make them popular, I 
think is going to be the Grasso play because it's a nice conservative play. You know, she's probably not going to get wiped out, you know, so even in losses, she scores something. And, you know, as far as underdogs go, she's just the least risky. I mean, when you want to play fighters like Yagos is a minus, it's a plus 250 with very little gas tank, or you want to play Lacerda who never gets out in the first round. You know, th these, these are extremely risky plays from the money line. So people are going to really get after it and play and play Grasso. So I think my advice when it comes to uh, construction is to probably, if you have to make some strategic fade, maybe just go zero Grasso I mean, and just, and just hope, hope for it. And then maybe play say only 33% Shevchenko and just hope, you know what I mean? So maybe fade this fight 67% of the time. And it's already going to be really, really low on. I mean, it's a very difficult fight to fade on the numbers. Um, so if you just play Shevchenko and completely fade Grasso, I think that that's probably okay. Um, and then just kind of to review, you know, you have these two really big favorites in Campbell and Rosas, which are extremely, extremely strong, and you probably want to try to get to. And you do have some high upside fights here. You know, you have you have the De Silva Chires, who I thought, you know, both sides of this were, were very, very strong. Um, you had the um, uh, Yagos, who I thought was a good underdog. And then you have these kind of like borderlines, like the Fremd, Nel the, the Fremd Kapilov fight, borderline, the Nelson Padilla fight. Padilla's fine. Nelson's probably borderline. Um, I think that you could you could fade the just the vicious Cortez fight and get I would say different. I mean it's sort of different to full fade that fight. Um, and then you could probably get away with full fading the Magdalena Holland fight. It's not easy to do, um, but I mean conceptually, but that's an okay thing to fade. Um, so there are ways you could there's ways you can attack this slate. Um, and then don't forget the possibility that Lupi Gadinias as you know can score like that 130 also like for example let me just see what this looks like you can't play all of these but like if you did this you get away with this now you can't quite do this oh and don't forget the punt play the mitchell play. so you can't play all four of these 130 guys okay because then you'd have let's see no you can't you couldn't afford that but you could play three of them so if you played three of them and let's say you know what you do? Let's say you fade the main event and you play these three. I mean, there's not a lot of combinations in here, but you can play some of these, some of these fighters. And the other thing you could do, like you want it to really, you want it to really be a pain in the neck. You play Godinez, you play Rosas, you play uh, not first, you play Godinez, you play Campbell, and you play Shevchenko. And you you know you get up to all these one thirties, and then you play like Mitchell. Let's go. You know what I mean? Imagine that. Imagine if you if you're sitting there and and like all these all these other under these, these good looking underdogs bust. You know, and and you're sitting there like the Duke with like two fights to go, and you have Mitchell. You know that's all you got, Mitchell and Shevchenko, and you have a forty five percent owned Rosas Junior. And he's 18, 19 years old. And you know that all you need is Mitchell Shevchenko for all the cheese. I mean, not that you're, you're, you're confident, but you'd sign for that, right? If you sign like right from the beginning that you were going to get Mitchell Shevchenko for all the money, I mean, let's go. So uh, I guess Mitchell's my kind of galaxy brain play of the, of the week. I just think the numbers support it. What can I tell you? All right. That'll do it. Uh, good luck, everybody.